Okay, so going back to these themes of how science works, you can really see, and I kind of picked up on some of these ideas already, that science is really shaped by this essential function of creating these theories, these hypotheses. And this is where all the crazy enters, right? This idea that somehow people could be reduced to stimulus response systems is just on the face of it, just, you know, at, like, there's no other word for it. It's crazy, right? There's no way that even comes close to capturing anything about our subjective experience. It had to be evident to these individuals with their own lives that they were not just these simple stimulus response systems. They had all these internal thoughts going on. Were they just shutting out all their thoughts? Did they never dream? Uh, it's just weird to think about what this person would be like, but it just goes to show you how strong these paradigms are and these trends and the idea that this could be like the way that psychology worked um, for a long period of time. And that if you thought about some other way of approaching it, involving internal kind of processes, you couldn't publish those papers, right? They had control over the, the entire field. So science is fundamentally this kind of human social activity. It's, it's absolutely kind of based on, on our own, the limits of our own creativity coming up with theories and hypotheses. We actually still use the data from the behaviorist time periods and we use the ideas from the behaviorist time periods. But uh, so it's not like it's wrong, it's just very, very limited. And so this ends up being the understanding of how science progresses, um, that you, you, you end up having a very narrow perspective and then building up over time progressively broader, more comprehensive uh, understanding of, of the objective world. So finally, we're going to look at the specific methods that are used in psychology and neuroscience today. Uh, there's three big categories of these, uh, descriptive, correlational, and experimental. And they each have kind of pros and cons highlighted here. So the descriptive approach is good because it's just a way of capturing kind of what's actually happening. You can, you can do that in a way that doesn't interfere with the system that you're studying. So this is very often used in anthropology to see how people actually behave in the real world, but it tends to be fairly weak data. It gives you these kind of qualitative, descriptive kind of things. It's, it's almost sort of like the introspectionist kind of approach. Um, uh, so what's the next step up from that is to introduce this notion of variables and reduce uh, some complex phenomenon down to something you can specifically measure and then in the correlational approach, you're looking at the relationships among those different variables. And this is still retains this kind of naturalistic approach. You can observe the system and just kind of record these variables and then look at the relationships among those variables without disturbing the system. And so it gives you a good understanding of kind of how these different variables are operating in the real system. But the critical problem with correlational approaches is that they do not tell you about causality. And this is a fundamental problem. Uh, everybody assumes that if you observe a correlation, that there must be some causal relationship among those variables, and that's just absolutely not true. Um, and this is also known as the third variable problem, which basically says that that correlation that you're observing could be due to some other additional variable that you're not measuring, which is actually giving rise to these two measure, two, two variables that you are measuring, and that that's actually driving the relationship, and that the individual variables themselves have no actual causal relationship. So we'll unpack that and look at that in a sec. But that's the major problem with correlational approaches. Then you have experimental approaches, which are really good for finally figuring out these causal relationships, cause and effect, what is actually driving uh, how the system works, okay? But the problem with this is that it absolutely requires random assignment. Uh, that's the only way you can get around all these third variables that might be lurking in the background is just to sort of throw random noise at the problem and, and completely uh, break any pre-existing associations among these variables. So you just take each person and put them randomly in one group or another, and then you uh, apply some manipulation to one group and not the other. And if you see a difference, you know that that difference is due to the manipulation that you performed 
and not due to some of these pre-existing factors, okay? Um, and so that's the fundamental logic of experimental science and experimental psychology. Uh, it's the most widely used technique, but it really has limitations as well because now you can only study phenomena for which you can do random assignment. Can you randomly assign people to be poor versus rich? No, not really, not ethically. Um, you know, the movie Trading Places tries to explore this, uh, but uh, realistically speaking, not really a plausible study. You know, uh, people who have different kinds of eating habits, you have these experiments where they try to manipulate that uh, in, in a random way, but it's very hard. And, and in all the studies that we see about health, um, the effects of different kind of lifestyles, all of those are subject to these kind of correlational problems because it's very hard to do a well-controlled random assignment kind of experimental study to look at those kinds of variables. And almost everything having to do with families and development, um, you know, you're born into whatever family you live in and you can't randomly assign kids to different families, uh, except in, a, again, a few very weird exceptional cases. So we call this external validity. These studies that we can do experimentally that give us great understanding about the kind of causal mechanisms, they may not help us understand what's actually happening in the real world that much. And this is actually a really important problem that, you know, plagues science. And a lot of people are trying to figure out ways around these approaches. But there are kind of trade-offs, pros and cons for each of these different methods. Okay, so let's, let's work through some of these details in the context of a, a real-world scenario so we can understand how these trade-offs uh, might operate. This is kind of a, an artificial case here. There's some weird things about it, but it, again, kind of captures the interest and hopefully generates some uh, real-world intuitions. So the hypothesis is my romantic partner is cheating on me. How do you determine if that is true or not? And one of the limitations of this is it's like a one-off thing. There's no population condition here. So uh, it's kind of a weird uh, thing you could, hard to look at scientifically, but anyway. So here's what you might do. In the descriptive case, you might just sort of, you know, note what's happening, right? Observe who your, your, your partner's hanging out with, uh, who they're paying attention to, whether they're acting strange or different to you, okay? Um, and you could do this in a way that's unobtrusive. Of course, you could get caught, you know, sneaking around uh, spying on them. Uh, but if you're good, you could theoretically avoid that problem and, and get a reasonable uh, kind of undisturbed naturalistic picture of what's happening. And then you could try to interpret that. Uh, but again, it's not going to be very definitive data. Everything's going to be uh, very uh, kind of hypothetical, unless, of course, you catch them in the act or something. Um, <laughs> then you have uh, correlational data where you sort of say, well, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to actually try to plot specific variables here and see if there's a cause, you know, an, a, an indication of a potential causal relationship. So uh, plot frequency of, you know, sexual intercourse or fights or good times and bad times over time and look at these historical trends and has, has there been a change? Is there some indication that somehow the system might have changed? Um, and that might give you some indication of something happening. Um, and then finally, with the experimental approach, uh, you could actually try to intervene in the system and manipulate some variables, right? So you actually probe your partner with challenging questions. Do you love those other people as much as you love me? And see how they react. You could ask them these horrible, unanswerable questions. Um, uh, you could try a manipulation of having somebody, you know, tempt them into cheating on you, right? Then, then you might know for sure. Um, but obviously, that's going to be disturbing the system, right? So here's the summary again. Uh, if you use these descriptive approaches, you don't disturb. You don't raise suspicions. But again, you may not have that much to go on. Uh, the correlational approach is also somewhat naturalistic, uh, and it gives you a more precise understanding. But of course, you end up with this problem of the third variable problem. Maybe all of these symptoms are just because you know, you've been in this relationship longer, and they're not cheating on you. It's just a natural course of relationships over time. And so you have to take into account that possible third variable of time itself. Um, and, and that might be causing the relationship and not the fact that they're actually actively cheating on you. Uh, and then in the experimental case, you could catch them in the act. You could actually catch this kind of causal relationship, but you might be creating this false truth. You might be creating something that didn't actually exist in the, in the original situation. 
especially you know if your friend succeeds in seducing them. Okay, so basically bad questions can lead to bad answers. And this is this challenge of external validity. Just to really hammer home this point about correlations, there are so many possible ways in which variables can look like they're related, okay? So this is a funny example of plotting uh, ratings of Saturday Night Live, you know, this kind of uh, famous TV show versus frequency of sex per month by age, okay? And indeed, the ratings of SNL have kind of gone down and so do the does the frequency of sex over age, okay? So does that mean that uh, someone's, what? I don't even know what that means, but this is kind of an absurd example, but there are many uh, such possible kinds of relationships that show up. Um, I'll show you later a website that, that uh, has many funny examples like this. So again, if you don't get anything else out of this whole discussion, please understand the limitations of correlational data because they really are so frequently reported in the media and they're so inaccurately treated as showing you a causal relationship. Everybody says, oh, if you drink alcohol, you know, you're going to get better health or worse health because this study found a correlation. That correlation does not mean there's a causal effect of drinking alcohol. You have to understand that.